There are places in this world where magic dwells. Where nature's mystic forces collide and wondrous creatures enchant the soul. Shimmering sun-dappled waters cast a spell over Australia's Great Barrier Reef. At China's Wolong National Park, the expressive gaze of the giant panda bewitches all who cross its path. In the Pacific, natural wonders haunt the Galapagos, the world's most magical islands. And conjured from the shadow of Mount Everest, man walks in awe among the creatures of the clouds. These are more than the greatest national parks of Asia and the Pacific. These are magic lands of enchantment. China is a land of ancient and astonishing treasures. Among them, the massive Great Wall, the world-famous terracotta warriors, and the genius of China's extraordinary artists. But her greatest treasure is a nature reserve called Wolong. Unique in all the world, this national park covers an area of 800 square miles in southwest China. It is astounding in its beauty and abundance. Hidden in this peerless sanctuary is one of the rarest animals on the planet, China's amazing giant panda. These precious and elusive creatures haunt the pristine forests of an enchanted national park called Wolong. Rising to the west of Wolong are the storied Four Sisters Mountains. According to an ancient and mysterious legend, four young shepherdesses lost their lives here, protecting giant pandas from snow leopards. In death, the fearless maidens assumed the shape of four snowy peaks. There may be some truth to their story. Fearsome snow leopards still lurk in the mountains. The leopard's pale color allows it to move unnoticed in search of prey. From the treeless mountain slopes, a series of winding trails ascends 14,700 feet to Wolong's western gateway. Below this breathless pass, the quest for the panda begins. The misty valleys and dense forests of Wolong harbor more giant pandas than any other park on Earth. For thousands of years, this landscape has provided them with refuge from the prying eyes of man. Our search will take us down steep valley walls to pristine rapids guarded by massive granite boulders.
In the shallows, forest birds hunt for aquatic insects. At lower elevations, gorgeous red-billed magpies abound. Their white-tipped tail feathers providing a splash of elegance. Fed by raging mountain tributaries, Wolong's powerful Pitiao River courses through the heart of the reserve. In Wolong's northeast sector, it collides with the Zheng River. This picture book stretch of unspoiled gorge is among the most striking in all of China. Unique species of flowers, plants, and trees thrive in Wolong, some with special cultural significance. One fascinating example is the Hua tree. Its peeling bark was used in ancient times as paper. Suspended from the branches of the sorbus tree is a type of moss called hanging noodle. In Wolong's treetop canopy, some animals seem to advertise their presence. This endearing primate is called a golden monkey. As many as 300 of them can travel in a group, feeding among the lofty ridges of the reserve. These vividly colored monkeys share Wolong's trees with another elusive creature. Mostly nocturnal and seldom seen, the red panda roams South Asia's high forests from Nepal to Myanmar. Although it's called a panda, it may be more closely related to raccoons than to its giant cousin. Still, like the giant panda, it is highly dependent on a priceless resource that springs from Wolong's soil. Bamboo. Without this one plant, all of Wolong's pandas would starve. Fortunately, bamboo thrives in Wolong. In fact, this remarkable plant is capable of growing an astonishing three feet in 24 hours. But bamboo has a less panda-friendly trait. Bamboo groves are subject to sudden die-offs. In a single season, all the bamboo at a given elevation can disappear. As a result, only the largest parks can successfully sustain a panda population. Needless to say, Wolong's bamboo groves are also the best place to glimpse a panda in the wild. Suddenly, from across the valley, a remarkable sound. There's no animal cry more stirring than the bleat of a panda in the wild. No moment more memorable than the first sighting of these extraordinary creatures.
giant pandas have wonderful appetites. They devour just under 40 pounds of bamboo a day. Eventually, this juvenile could reach a weight of 300 pounds. The panda prefers a life of solitude and will only seek out partners during the mating season. In spring, the female will come into heat for only a few days. As a result, pandas have offspring only once every two years on average. In fall, mothers give birth to helpless babies weighing only two ounces. For the next year and a half, they'll be breastfed. If they're not marking their territory, foraging for bamboo, or munching it, they're resting or sleeping, wherever they please. And though they have little to fear from natural predators, pandas are accomplished climbers. The giant panda has lived in China for three million years. But in recent centuries, human habitation has narrowed this ancient bear's range to a few small havens in the south. Today, there are as few as 1,000 giant pandas left in the wild. And many of those pandas are vulnerable to the mass die-offs of flowering bamboo. But here in Wolong, there's always enough bamboo at different altitudes to go around. Even in the depths of winter, Wolong's giant pandas can still find plenty of dried bamboo to eat. Endlessly endearing, these creatures are maintaining their foothold on the future. In this land of enchanted maidens and snowy peaks, they are the jewels in a crown called Wolo. Beneath the tropical waters of the South Pacific lies an underwater realm, lavish, resplendent, an overturned treasure chest brimming with jewels. Australia's Great Barrier Reef Marine Park has a diversity of life to match a rainforest. complete with quiet grazers and ferocious predators. The corals themselves, their exquisite hues and boundless forms, celebrate the infinite imagination of nature. In life, corals are colonies of tiny animals, protected by vivid limestone skeletons. In death, their skeletal remains become the foundation of a miracle called the Great Barrier Reef. From the air, it seems to stretch to the horizon. In fact, 
The reef is so vast, it can be seen from outer space. Located roughly 80 miles off the coast of Northeast Australia, it is the largest coral formation in the world. Over a thousand miles long, it covers an area that's almost the size of California. The waters of the reef are a virtual paradise for coral, the greatest builders in the animal kingdom. It flourishes in hundreds of forms, some whimsical, some elegant. Their names describe their outward form. Brain coral. Fan coral. Carnation coral. And staghorn coral. These enchanted groves may seem like a magic garden, but these are no plants. They are vast colonies of individual animals no bigger than a pea. Carl's closest relatives are the jellyfish. This is a soft coral. Each one of its feathers is a single animal. Such individuals are called polyps. Each colony grows from one pioneering polyp, which buds off daughter polyps, each genetically identical to the founding mother. Thriving in the reef's warm, shallow currents, this tireless architect has created the largest animal structure on the planet. Over the course of a few thousand years, an entire chain of limestone islands has been built on the back of its labors. Beneath them is a liquid landscape of delights. An underwater jungle bursting with mysterious creatures. Giant clams permanently anchor themselves to the coral and weigh in at a hefty 200 pounds. Some believe their great shells will close on a diver's leg and drown him. But in reality, the clam's flesh is velvet soft and yielding. Moray eels are a more likely threat. They grow up to 12 feet long, but can tuck into coral crevices in a matter of seconds. With just its head protruding, the eel waits patiently to snag a passing fish. The Maori wrasse finds enough delectable crustaceans hidden in the coral to grow up to nine feet in length. In this world of predators, it's dangerous to be a small fry with no friends. In exchange for protection, the tiny cleaner fish keeps a humphead Maori wrasse free of parasites. The sea anemone and these orange clownfish strike a similar bargain. The tentacles of the anemone are laced with a deadly venom but the tiny clownfish is immune to the toxin. Instead, they lure bigger prey into the anemone's deadly embrace in exchange for safe haven. But the ultimate predator of the reef is the shark. White-tipped reef sharks are the most common and like to retire to caves underneath the coral. Thank you. 
divers are well advised not to disturb their nap. Weighing as much as most sharks, but a lot less sensational, these plump vegetarian mammals are relatives of the manatee. Called dugongs, they graze on the meadows of seagrass surrounding the reef. It's said that lonely sailors once mistook these creatures for mermaids and followed them to watery deaths. Australia's native people, the Aborigines, perhaps less romantically inclined, called them sea pigs. Still, it's true love that brings the humpback whales to the reef each fall. These 80-ton giants mate within sight of both the reef and the islands that fringe it. Some islands in the park are large enough to provide a home to land-loving animals. One such island is like a miniature version of Australia, together with all its extraordinary wildlife. This lush, song-filled tropical paradise is home to thriving stands of eucalyptus trees. And nestled in their branches are some of Australia's most cherished inhabitants, the koala. Their diet consists solely of eucalyptus leaves. When they're not munching, Families of koalas will spend their time dozing high in the forks of trees. A koala can snooze for as long as 18 hours a day. As the sun sets over the Pacific, it's time for the night shift to begin. The Great Barrier Reef never sleeps. A curious looking cuttlefish sets out on a search for food. Other denizens of the reef prepare for nocturnal intruders. The parrotfish makes a balloon of slime for protection from predators. But the corals of the reef are defenseless as a mortal enemy closes in. It's called the crown of thorns starfish. It has a particularly gruesome way of eating. The starfish exudes its stomach over a coral polyp and dissolves it. In one evening, a single crown of thorns starfish can wipe out a coral colony that's more than a hundred years old. But the corals of the Great Barrier Reef do endure. In fact, thanks to an extraordinary strategy, they're able to expand their limestone realm. In late fall, about five days after a full moon, when currents are weakest, the Pacific's most incredible spectacle unfolds across the Great Barrier Reef. Hundreds of species of coral all spawn simultaneously. Each polyp releases its egg and sperm, and sex cells fill the sea by the billions. Like confetti on New Year's Eve, like a ticker tape parade, they drift in the currents. The vast majority of the eggs will be eaten, an annual feast for the creatures of the reef. Billions more will wash ashore. 
but a few will meet by chance in the reef's warm waters. As they join together, fresh polyps are created. New colonies take hold, and the empire of coral is restored. The waters of this marine sanctuary may be shallow, but their grace and beauty leave a profound impression. The Great Barrier Reef is an astonishing act of nature. It is an underwater marvel that marries epic scale to exquisite charm. A visual feast full of enchantment and surprise. ago, the sun rose on a fiery miracle. Lava from the restless heart of the planet burst to the surface of the Pacific Ocean. For eons, underwater eruptions had been building submerged mountains, and now their molten summits lay exposed the Galapagos Islands. Volcanic eruptions continue to build these islands. Havens of diversity like none other on Earth. They comprise today the Galapagos Islands National Park. Born of fire, scattered on an endless sea, these same islands are a paradox without comparison. They cradle an extraordinary community of creatures unrivaled in all the world. The Galapagos Islands National Park lies over 600 miles off the west coast of South America. Its 19 islands and 42 islets are part of the nation of Ecuador. The names of the main islands are as exotic as the creatures that inhabit them. Fernandina, Bartolome, Española, Santiago. The islands are small, but their impact on how we view the world and its creatures is profound. This is Isabella. One of the youngest islands in the chain, Isabella is the hot-headed member of the family. She breached the surface of the Pacific Ocean less than a million years ago. And she can still spew lava today. Even when her volcanoes are quiet, the hot steam vents that dot her hills are reminders of the furnaces still churning below. Yet already tucked in amongst the sharp-edged crags, new life has taken hold. When the first Galapagos Island was born, the nearest land animals lived more than 500 miles away. Miraculously, over the millennia, a host of creatures and plants would make their way to these infant islands. Because of the Galapagos' isolation, they encountered sanctuaries free of terrestrial predators. Fear, according to scientists, is just a behavioral adaptation, and when it's unnecessary, it disappears. 
In the absence of fear, the Galapagos' creatures possess an unspoiled innocence. The first reptiles on the Galapagos were probably iguanas. They would have looked a lot like bees. They found little to eat on the lava except for the mosses that grow only on the water's edge. In order to survive, they had to adapt. Today, they are the only sea-going lizards on Earth. Little dragons, they are found on these enchanted isles and nowhere else. Unique they may be, but there's no shortage. With over 4,500 animals per mile of coastline, marine iguanas number 200,000 strong within the park. Naturally cold-blooded, they huddle to conserve heat in the warm morning sun. Sneezing to release excess salt. The bounty of the sea provides an easy life for these immigrants. But inland from the coast, it's a different story. The craters of active and inactive volcanoes dominate everything. Good soil is scarce. Only prickly cactuses seem to flourish. They may look unappetizing, but for this mighty land iguana, they're the best thing on the menu. Like B-movie dinosaurs, they stalk the volcanic landscape. Up to 10 times the size of its marine brothers and some 30 pounds in weight, land iguanas are loners. Even the sight of a female elicits little more than a nod. In this parched environment, energy conservation is everything. But not all the Galapagos Islands are as dry and barren as Isabella. Others are lush by comparison. Santa Cruz is almost three quarters of a million years older. Its lava flows have eroded into rich volcanic soils now covered with forests. The star of Santa Cruz is the giant Galapagos tortoise. They may look ponderous, but when they want to, these 400 pound tanks can really move. Top speed? Okay, so it's a little less than a half a mile an hour. One of the longest lived animals on the planet, some specimens have lived for a hundred years. Despite being hunted to the verge of extinction, these gentle giants have never learned how to fear humans. 
their reaction to their most dangerous predator is a blank reptilian stare. The tameness of the tortoises fascinated the English naturalist Charles Darwin when his ship, the Beagle, first sailed to the Galapagos in 1835. But what really intrigued him was the sheer variety of animals on the islands. I never dreamed that islands, about 50 or 60 miles apart, and most of them in sight of each other, formed of precisely the same rocks, placed under a similar climate, rising to near equal height, would be inhabited by different beings. And the most different of those beings were the Galapagos finches. Then, as now, they were unassuming birds. But today, they are as celebrated as the great man himself. For what Darwin observed was that the shape of finch beaks varied from one island to another. It was, he theorized, evidence that new species had evolved here. But the question remained, how? We seem to be brought somewhere near to that great fact, that mystery of mysteries, the first appearance of new beings on this earth. Darwin would ponder that mystery for more than 20 years. Then in 1859, he published On the Origin of Species. Natural selection, he declared, was the engine of evolution. And from that moment on, the Galapagos Islands and their finches entered the history books. While less mysterious than Darwin's finches, far more entertaining birds live on Española, one of the oldest islands in the park, her ancient shoreline has eroded into dizzying cliffs. Here, vast colonies of shorebirds make their living with easy access to the sea. Española is also home to nature's most unexpected waltzers. the blue-footed booby, and the albatross. While the two species have never danced with each other, surely on these enchanted islands, it's only a matter of time. But the most celebrated heartthrobs on the Galapagos are the magnificent frigate birds of North Seymour Island. These ardent lovebirds mate year round, and their approach is anything but subtle. Males inflate a huge red pouch under their throats in order to lure airborne females to their nests.
female frigates observe the males carefully. In turn, they display their feathered valentines from dawn to dusk. If a female deems it lacking, it's all to no avail, at least for now. Romance, it seems, is as hard to find on the Galapagos as anywhere else on Earth. But compared with finding a comfortable place to sleep on an island made of rock, it's practically a breeze. Life is not easy on the Galapagos, but it's certainly unique. <coughs> to gaze out to sea from these lowly outcrops is to gaze into the very mystery of life itself. It is the tallest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. 29,035 feet high. Its summit seems to touch the very edge of space. This crown of the Himalayas is more than a point on the globe. For daring climbers, reaching its summit is the goal of a lifetime. Yet Everest is something else again. The highest point of the breathtaking Himalayan wilderness that rests in its shadow. Its lower reaches are cloaked in clouds. Beneath them lies a myriad array of enchanting life and gorgeous blooms. In essence, Mount Everest National Park celebrates the boundless extremes of nature. The park adorns the central Himalayas of Nepal. Most of it is steep and rugged terrain broken only by deep gorges and glacial valleys. Some 50 million years ago, at the border of India and Asia, vast geological forces thrust the mountains we call the Himalayas up towards the heavens. Three of the ten highest peaks on Earth are here, in this most monumental of all great national parks. Already in the company of clouds, its lowest point is nowhere less than 10,000 feet high. Along the slopes of these dizzying peaks, a menagerie of exotic animals abound. Yak wander the meadows. Red pandas haunt the woodlands. And tree-climbing musk deer and blue sheep all roam the rugged hillsides of this Himalayan park. Birds, of course, have an easier time moving backwards and forwards across even the mightiest mountains. And for a Himalayan griffin, soaring on the rising currents of warm air, 
There is no barrier on Earth that can keep it from moving at will. In Mount Everest National Park, distances can be deceiving. A few miles as a bird flies can be a day-long journey over a series of perilously steep, zigzagging trails. Often, what appears to be a final summit is only a ridge, and the real goal is another 3,000-foot climb. Perhaps only the Sherpas know all the tricks these mountains play. About 3,500 of these hardy mountain folk live in the villages within the park's boundaries. World-class mountaineers who visit here know the Sherpas are the indispensable key to a successful climb. These native people are world famous for their ability to carry large loads over the most mountainous terrain. Tough and courageous, they are well adapted to the extremes of their high altitude home. In the spring, rhododendrons in lower elevations carpet the park slopes in brilliant red. High alpine meadows fill with blossoms. And all over the park, the Monao pheasant, Nepal's national bird, displays his magnificent finery. Spring is also a busy season for mountaineers and Sherpas. Everyone knows that the window of opportunity is a brief one. Ascending through 16,000 feet, even professional climbers become humble visitors. Trees no longer grow in this thin air. Buffeted by winds and extreme temperatures, the Himalayan tar is one of the few creatures to make a living in the steep cliffs above the tree line. Males display their thick manes to females as if to signal their ability to keep themselves warm no matter how arctic conditions become. Twenty thousand feet. Now scrub, grasses, even lichens disappear. This is the upper limit of life. Above this elevation, virtually the only living creature is the mountain climber. They come for this, the mountain that gives this park its name. Everest to most of the world, to the Nepalese, her name is Sagarmata, mother of the universe. She is a forbidding challenge, yet irresistible to some. The first attempt at the summit was mounted in 1922. That climb was abandoned at 27,000 feet when an avalanche claimed the lives of seven Sherpas.
Their sacrifice marked the beginning of a struggle to conquer Everest that spanned 32 years. Then in 1953, Edmund Hillary and Sherpa Tenzing Norgay became the first men in history to witness the view from the top of the world. Today, brave mountaineers continue to follow in the footsteps of Hillary and Norgay as they meet treacherous challenges en route to the summit. The journey is perilous. Sherpas and climbers have to use lightweight ladders to bridge their way through this chaotic maze of ice blocks and fatal crevasses. It's a rare breed of man that chooses to face nature at her most hostile. The thin air alone is enough to reduce strong men to feeble children. And then there are the winds. Storms can appear without warning. Temperatures can drop to 40 below zero in a matter of minutes. High winds pummel climbers, gusting at more than 100 miles an hour. Then, at last, for the lucky few, the peak is reached. Below, the greatest panorama in all of nature. The view from five miles high. Everest. It is more than a mountain. It is an icon. An enduring symbol of nature's power to inspire us. And to challenge us to reach the ultimate goal. The top of the world.